if Strike Three's complaints are stripped of all their conclusory statements, they are left with the notion that merely subscribing to an IP address that downloaded copyrighted works is sufficient to make out a cause of action for copyright infringement. This is not sufficient. All right, so next is the story that I'm really excited about. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to contain myself because we have been waiting for years for one of these serial copyright litigants to get just totally thrown out of court. This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. We saw it earlier this year with Royce Lamberth and Strike Three Holdings in the District of Columbia. We did a video about that. I'll put that up on a bubble on the screen in the video. Now, New Jersey, who had previously approved in the legally, technically procedural sense. They agreed with the Strike Three Holdings previously filing lawsuits in New Jersey. Some 311 lawsuits have been filed in New Jersey, and the vast majority of them seem to have been approved. This is my job. This is my focus. This is the kind of case that I work on. Exactly the kind of case I literally have clients in New Jersey, and we are trying to figure out what this means. It literally just dropped on Friday night. I was at a wedding all weekend. And so in the middle of like the any downtime in between wedding events, I was reading this 47 page opinion, trying to figure out how and why and what the effect is of Judge Schneider of the Camden vicinage of the District of New Jersey United States District Court, who totally threw strike three holdings out of court on its butt, calling it a copyright troll just like Royce C. Lamberth. This opinion addresses whether to grant Strike Three Holdings leave to conduct expedited discovery in its uniform John Doe copyright infringement cases. I'll just translate that a little bit here. Strike Three conducting expedited discovery means it wants to learn a John Doe's identity before it has served the John Doe and gone through some required legal process first. You're not supposed to be able to conduct discovery in the beginning, you conduct discovery in the middle. We are at the beginning and they want discovery, so those things don't jive. We are literally out of order. You know, Judge bangs the gavel, out of order, order. You're out of order. You're literally going out of order. And so the subpoena, the out of order, or expedited, because it's early, uh, discovery, the out of order subpoena is to uncover a John Doe's identity and, and, and then later then, then subject them to copyright infringement claims. And Strike 3 doesn't help their case too much here. Strike 3 is suing over adult entertainment, which sometimes makes it difficult to talk about. So that's why you might not see it in the news more, because then reporters who write about it have to confront how do they write about such kind of entertainment. You will even hear me not using the P word and probably not even using the you know, adult word too often, because that will definitely trigger the demonetization bot on YouTube. Strike 3 argues that unless its motions are granted, it will not be able to identify infringers and stop infringement. This opinion adds to the mountain of case law on the issue. Why would there be a mountain of case law? Well, we've talked about Leibowitz's 1100 filings or 1600 filings. Who the heck cares about that? Strike 3 Holdings has filed over 3300 lawsuits in the past three years. And Malibu Media has filed over 6,000, it might even be 7,000 by now, 8,300 Malibu Media cases, including five recently in the Northern District of Illinois. So yeah, so there's a lot of copyright litigation going on. And so there's a mountain of case law on the issue. After a deep dive into Strike Three's practices, including two evidentiary hearings and extensive briefing, the court concludes that Strike Three's requests for expedited discovery are denied. The court finds that Strike Three has not established good cause to take the requested discovery, and the discovery is unreasonable under the present circumstances. The court's going to refer to an exemplar complaint. All the complaints are boilerplate complaints except for the IP address, the identity of the John Doe that they don't know yet, and the, the actual alleged downloads and any circumstantial evidence of other downloads. That's it. That's all that Strike 3 has. So 
think of that think of how little they have in in and then think of what they're trying to do should they really be able to get a person's identity who is the subscriber to the internet account and automatically call them the defendant without knowing anything more about who the infringer actually is should they be able to use evidence of infringement all by itself to gain access to your private computer and deposing you under oath without knowing which person behind the subscriber, including the subscriber, could be the infringer. That's that's what we're here about. And I made these arguments. I have made every one of these arguments in court before, and I have been denied. So the fact that this is affirming these arguments is very validating for me and for Heather, who has also worked on these cases with me. How do you feel about this opinion, Tactical? Um, I think it's an odd mixture of validation and frustration and hope. Because, yeah. yes, it's validating that we've made all of these arguments, but then that's also a little bit frustrating that when we made the arguments, it was denied. Yeah. But yet you have another judge saying, okay, actually, we've thoroughly reviewed this. We've asked for a lot of background information. <laughs> and you don't necessarily... Yeah. have what you say you have it it turns out leonard and and heather were correct they just they just didn't convince that judge <laughs> that's what it feels like so leonard as an attorney some attorneys might feel worried about this right okay. because some attorneys might feel like their uh their the thing that their firm is built on is going to be taken away from them if this continues if more if this happens more often Oh, you mean you know like mean? I'll be out of a job if 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 Strike Three and Malibu can't file any more lawsuits? Yeah, I'm fine with and that. Is it unethical to feel that way? It it would be. I'm I have a fiduciary duty to my clients. It wouldn't be unethical for me to feel bad about it. It would be unethical for me to prolong a client's matter so because I know that there won't be any more. Like that would be unethical. If I if I do something against the client's best interests in order to serve my interests, that's where it becomes unethical, I think. Also, I think that there, that we get to know um, the clients and we get to know their stories and how negatively these lawsuits affect them. And um, I've, I've, had, I've, I've had very emotional reactions when people have told their stories or gotten their case dismissed or whatever. And so the idea that people aren't going to be sued over this... Um, I, I would still consider that a win, even if we yeah. have to find a new way to make money. I would still think that some form of justice had been done. And so. right now, this is just New Jersey. And we don't actually know whether it's just these four cases or whether it's all New Jersey cases and whether this will be appealed. It might be appealed. Strike Three Holdings has appealed Royce Lamberth's decision. So this might be appealed. And so we'll get Third Circuit. This is This is Third Circuit, I think. New Jersey is Third Circuit, and we'll get new. We'll get Third Circuit case law on exactly the issue that I litigated in Pennsylvania and Virginia. So Virginia is not Third Circuit, though I don't think. So there's lots actually. There's lots actually to this. We're going to try to get through it in a reasonable amount of time. There's 47 pages, but a lot of it can be um, summarized, and so we're going to just start f uh, uh, kind of flying through this. Try to keep up. The most fundamental basis of the court's decision is, in its conclusion, that as pleaded, Strike Three's complaints are futile. <laughs> complaints, your complaint is futile. The court denies Strike Three the right to bootstrap discovery based on a complaint that does not pass muster under the motion to dismiss standard 12b6, Federal Civil Procedure 12b6 which is failure to state a claim. Even if Strike 3 pleads a cognizable copyright infringement claim, the court would still deny its request for expedited discovery. Good cause does not exist because 1. Strike 3 bases its complaints on unequivocal, affirmative representations of facts that it does not know to be true. So this is my one of my main arguments is they plead in the complaint that the defendant is the subscriber and then they amend the complaint to the name even if the defendant is not the subscriber so they used that initial allegation to get in the door and then they changed it 
On the other hand, though, we just saw the Amar el Ansari win, where the Pennsylvania Appeals Court, the Superior Court, said that Amar el Ansari could change his initial complaint, and that filing an amended complaint just simply negates the original complaint. So if they make the accusation and get in the door and then change the accusation to a different person because they found somebody else, well, isn't that just fine? Uh, the New Jersey court doesn't think so. Strike three subpoenas are misleading and create too much of an opportunity for misidentification. This is the argument that they, they only subpoena the IP address subscriber for one infringement, but they sue for multiple infringements over the course of multiple time periods. So wouldn't you need to check dynamic IP address owners over every infringement or at least from the beginning to end of the time period and then anything where it changed in between? No, they don't do that. The linchpin of Strike Three's good cause argument that exploit discovery is the only way to stop infringement is wrong. So there are other ways to stop infringement. Strike Three has other available means as a second stop infringement argument that there are other means available to stop or mitigate infringements, that the lawsuits don't have a deterrent effect, or at least there's questions, that substantial prejudice may inure or may become a burden on subscribers who are misidentified, Strikes and Strike 3 underestimates the potential interest subscribers have in the constitutionally protected privacy of their subscription information. It turns out New Jersey has a privacy law about subscriber information. On balance, the court finds that the administration of justice and prejudice to the subscriber outweighs Strike 3's interest in expedited discovery. It is not lost on the court that its ruling may make it more difficult for Strike 3 to enforce its copyrights against potential infringers. However, the Third Circuit recently stated in Diabate versus Attorney General of the U.S., a October 9th, 2019 Third Circuit case, maybe we should cover that at some point, Courts must enforce the law even when the results seem inequitable or unfair. The court is aware that it has granted expedited discovery requests in the past, filed by Strike 3 Holdings and other frequent, fl frequent flyers, I said, of copyright litigation. However, as was famously said, the court sees no reason why it should be consciously wrong today because it was unconsciously wrong yesterday, meaning it has become aware, it has learned, it has grown, so it should, it should learn and grow and now make a better decision, even if the decision is now different. Since its previous orders were entered, new relevant case law has been published, the court has learned of new material information that was not previously presented, and we are going to discuss it all. I'm going to move at a breakneck speed here at some point. So Greg Lansky founded General Media Systems in 2015. He has created some of the most popular entertainment in the world. They have filed 311 cases alone in New Jersey out of over 3,000 complaints nationwide to date. The court has managed many of Strike 3's cases and so understands their modus operandi to be essentially the same. They file John Doe complaints, naming unidentified subscribers of an IP address as infringers on the BitTorrent network. BitTorrent is a peer-to-peer -peer software protocol for distributing data, written by Bram Cohen in the late 1990s. The BitTorrent network permits users to download, copy, and distribute Strike 3's movies. The only pleaded connection in Strike 3's complaints between the John Doe defendant and the alleged infringement is that John Doe is the subscriber. That's it. That's the only alleged connection. They don't even allege more than that. Strike 3 acknowledges that it does not know if the subscriber or someone else downloaded its works. After filing its complaint, it files ex parte or one-sided motions for expedited discovery requesting leave to serve a subpoena on the John Doe's internet service provider. And this has been one of our arguments as well. The ex parte standard requires them to give facts, even if those facts are not favorable. When you have an adversary even a pro se adversary, but also a represented adversary, you can make your statements all day long because you've got somebody to oppose you when you say something that's hyperbolic or incorrect or whatever. 
when they're not there, as in this case, the John Doe's not been served yet. We don't know who they are. So the ex parte standard or, or level of conduct or level of disclosure that is required is higher. Strike three has to look at what the defendant's likely arguments would be and more or less present those facts and arguments to the judge as well. So strike three is not doing that, is what they're saying here. So they send subpoenas, and then they start to cite an exemplar complaint. Alleged infringement occurred on 31 occasions, so 31 infringements, from December 3rd, 2017 to August 16th, 2018, on a dynamic IP address. The subscriber identified in the response to the November 13th, 2018 subpoena may or may not be the same person who subscribed to the IP address on July 27th, 2018. After Strike Three's motion for expo discovery is granted and its subpoena served and responded to, the ISP identifies the current subscriber to the listed IP address. Importantly, this is not necessarily the same person who subscribed to the IP address at, the, at, at, at one of the alleged dates and times. In other words, they file one subpoena for 31 infringements that occurred over a long period of time well, the IP address could have changed, and they don't subpoena whether the IP address changed. They just subpoena the IP address for one instance. They cite to Roy C. Lamberth's opinion. In a blistering opinion, Judge Lamberth denied Strike Three's ex parte request and accused them of being a copyright troll using technology that is famously flawed, preying on low-hanging fruit, and not caring whether the defendant actually did the infringing and flooding the courthouse with lawsuits smacking of extortion. The opinion raised red flags regarding Strike Three's lawsuits that caused this court to explore the issue further. In order to get to the bottom of the matter, the court issued an order to show cause to Strike Three, directing it to show cause why the court should not adopt and follow Judge Lamberth's opinion and order and deny Strike Three's discovery motion. Since that time, the court has received extensive briefs and background materials and held two evidentiary hearings. The court will summarize what it has learned and explain in detail why Strike Three's requests are denied. Strike Three's infringement investigation starts with IPP International, located in Germany. Strike Three hired IPP to track the infringement of its copyrights across the BitTorrent network. It does this by crawling the BitTorrent file distribution network and establishing a direct connection with the alleged infringer's IP address. They go on to explain what IP addresses are. Computers need an IP address to work on the internet, and IP addresses are unique. And your modem will have an IP address that is a public-facing IP address that can, can be used to identify at least that piece of equipment that you subscribe to. IPP identifies the ISP and other content downloaded using the subscriber's IP address. It records everything in a packet capture and then sends this data to Strike 3 on a monthly basis. Which, which might explain the sort of monthly filing of lawsuits. According to Strike 3, it only tries to stop the worst infringers. This accounts for why Strike 3 may be aware that a particular IP address is being used to infringe its works for a significant period of time before a complaint is filed. That's the pretense or excuse that they use to accumulate infringements, is that they just want to stop the worst infringers, so they're not suing everybody on the first infringement. But they're also not issuing takedown notices on any infringement. For example, although the exemplar complaint was filed on September 20th, 2018, the subscriber's infringement allegedly occurred on 31 separate occasions from December 3rd, 2017 to August 16th, 2018. Strike 3 was aware of ongoing infringement for at least nine months before it filed its complaint. So is that really, is that really deterrence if you're, if you're waiting to accumulate infringements? After Strike Three's data analytics contractor identifies a serial infringer, Strike Three runs the IP address through MaxMind for geolocation to in order to determine where to sue. Strike Three's John Doe complaints name as the defendant the unidentified IP subscriber, but Strike Three acknowledges it does not know who infringed its works. 
Strike 3 also acknowledges it only has a fairly good reason to believe that it is the subscriber or someone in the household. Strike 3 does not know who or how many people live in the household and has no idea if there's anyone else in the house. In addition, Strike 3 is not sure whether the subscriber lives at the location associated with the IP address. Because of dynamic IP addresses, Strike 3 does not know for sure if the subscriber identified in response to its subpoena is the same subscriber at the time of the alleged infringement which occurred months earlier. Despite its admitted lack of knowledge of who downloaded its works, whether the subscriber lives in the house or the address, Strike 3's complaints unequivocally aver in conclusory fashion that the listed subscriber to the identified IP address directly infringed its copyrights. In other words, they leave no wiggle room for the subscriber to be just a subscriber and for there to be someone else to be the infringer. They always sue the subscriber and accuse the subscriber of the infringement to get to the subscriber's identity. Then, if they think that maybe the subscriber, maybe, maybe it's not the subscriber, and this is a think, this is not a no, this is a think. They're making an educated guess as to who consumes this kind of entertainment and who might be technologically savvy to use BitTorrent and who would be of an age range where they would consume said content and have access to a computer and the internet. So if all those factors are met, basically an adult tech savvy male, they sue that person instead. But to get to that person, they didn't conduct an investigation into who the infringer was. They guessed. They're right a number of times, but they're also wrong a rather high number of times. So they allege that the defendant used BitTorrent to illegally download a distributed uh, plaintiff's copyrighted motion pictures, defendant was infringing, defendant downloaded, defendant's infringement is continuous, defendant copied. These are all references to defendant as subscriber. Strike 3 makes these unequivocal averments even though it recognizes the subscriber may not have downloaded its works. And that, I say, is in violation of the ex parte standard as well. It argues that this is necessary since only the ISP can match the name of the customer to the IP address. After it receives the subscriber's identity, it conducts an initial investigation and decides whether to amend its complaint. Strike 3 estimates that 35 to 40 percent of the time it decides to dismiss and not amend its complaints. In the interim, Strike 3 may also settle with the subscriber or someone else, and that is, that is my job, that has been my job over the last number of years, is trying to find people to fight Strike 3 holdings on these grounds. And unfortunately, very many people are very lawsuit averse and they don't want to go into litigation no matter how much I try to convince them. And, and I only convince them when it's in their best interest, uh, FYI, like that's important. All right, so there's a standard for obtaining expedited discovery. It's not appropriate in every situation, and we don't grant it regularly. It's actually not preferred. It's preferred that we don't do it this way. They use a totality of the circumstances to determine if good cause exists. A totality of the circumstances test to determine if good cause exists to grant X by discovery the, so the court will examine all relevant considerations. And so they go back to obtaining discovery re regarding any non-privileged matter that is relevant to a party's claim or defense. That's the relevancy standard, and anything that's relevant is discoverable. And you have to turn over work. You have to turn over works or, or turn over um, documents or testimony or whatever. Anything that is relevant is fair game. That means that if I'm sued and I've got documents that can be used against me, I can't destroy them. And if you ask for them properly, I have to give them to you, even if it can be used against me. This is not a criminal matter. District courts possess broad discretion in the management of the discovery process and can expedite or otherwise alter timing or sequence. And that's how we got here, is because the court is given the discretion to make these decisions and so they made the decision that sure, Strike 3 Holdings can get all these subscribers' identities. Unlike most other discovery provisions, Rule 26D does not give any guidance as to the standard to use to determine if expedited discovery is appropriate. Can, can you start to see why we're here? Courts in this district have applied one of two standards. The first is known as the Preliminary Injunction Standard, the Notaro Test. The second is the less stringent good cause or reasonableness test called the good cause test. 
Courts routinely apply the good cause test in this district in order to decide if expedited discovery is appropriate. The court looks to the totality of the circumstances and a balancing of the interests of the plaintiff and defendant. The court decides to apply that standard here. The non-exclusive list of factors courts examine are the timing of the request in light of the formal start of discovery. So in other words, how close are we all, are we to discovery right now? We're as far as you possibly can get, basically. Whether the request is narrowly tailored, the purpose of the discovery, whether the discovery burdens a defendant, whether the defendant can respond to the request in an expedited manner. Plaintiff asks the court to analyze its requests for discovery using the Arista Records test, which is the Second Circuit test. The court declines. The court declines Strike Three's request to pigeonhole the court's discretion. The Arista standard has not been adopted by the court and is not typically used in this district. Further, as has been noted by at least one court, the utility of the Arista standard is limited. The court's ruling would be the same in any event. The court deems it important to clarify several assumptions. First, the fact that Strike 3 is involved in the kind of entertainment business it is, is irrelevant. So nothing to do with the content of the material. Two, no one can reasonably dispute that an entity whose copyrights are infringed should have recourse against the infringer. Nevertheless, as discussed herein, a legal remedy does not exist for every wrong. Strike 3 is not entitled to relief simply because it was wronged. 3. The court acknowledges that the information Strike 3 requests is relevant under the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Even if an IP subscriber is not the infringer, he or she is likely to know relevant information regarding who used their internet access. Nonetheless, relevancy is not the touchstone to grant expedited discovery. If it was, expedited discovery could become the rule rather than the exception. Right, like I said, it's not favored. Four, even though numerous cases discuss the fact that Strike 3 has or may engage in abusive litigation practices, the court has not seen evidence that this occurred in its cases. To be clear, the court cannot vouch this has never occurred. The court can only say that it has no knowledge. And and I'll go on, uh, I guess this is some kind of record. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't really mean that to be a court record, but I'll go on this record and say that I haven't seen Strike 3 do anything that I would consider truly like unprofessional or a violation of the rules of professional conduct. I, I think they violated maybe the ex parte rule here. Uh, that's a rule of professional conduct, but I'm not a party and I can't make that argument without a client who's willing to make that complaint. And even then, this is an arguable non-violation of ex parte rules because the, the Strike 3 has been filing these and they've been approved by so many judges and so many judges have defended these practices that I don't know that there's insufficient gray area here or insufficient wiggle room. And I don't think you're going to be able to nail them to the wall. They're going to be a little slippery there on that one, is what I'm thinking. The most fundamental reason is that Strike 3 does not plead a cognizable claim. So hear me out if you follow through, like, do they have a copyright? Do they properly plead copyright infringement? No, they don't properly plead copyright infringement against an identifiable individual. It would be anomalous to authorize discovery based on a John Doe complaint that does not pass muster under the motion to dismiss standard, especially in the John Doe context where a complaint must be carefully scrutinized and a viable defendant is not present to challenge the complaint. It is unreasonable to authorize Strike 3 to bootstrap discovery onto a futile complaint. The court understands that in the present context, it is not deciding a motion to dismiss. However, if the court did not examine the futility of a John Doe complaint, it would create too great an opportunity for trickery and gamesmanship, which the court is not saying occurred here. They're, they're using very strong language. We're not saying this actually occurred. They're saying that the reason why we don't let this happen is because it invites gamesmanship and trickery. Further, in the context of deciding whether expert discovery should be granted, futility is a relevant consideration in a totality of the circumstances analysis. So they're, they're considering everything, so they're going to consider everything. Turning to the viability of Strike 3's form complaints or boilerplate complaints, 
the court finds that as pleaded, the complaints are futile. You must plead ownership of a valid copyright and copying of elements of the work that are original. The court does not take issue with the ownership issue, but it does with the proving copyright infringement issue. Scores of cases address whether Strike Three's form complaints pass muster. Admittedly, the case law is split. The court recognizes that whether by virtue of inertia or some other reason, the majority view, the majority of the courts that make decisions, is that at least at the pleading stage, this initial stage of the case, Strike Three's complaints withstand dismissal and are not dismissed. However, although Strike Three can cite to a legion of cases, Upholding its John Doe complaints, a substantial number of cases take the contrary view. This court sides with the cases that hold that it is not sufficient to merely allege in a pleading that the defendant is a subscriber of an IP address traced to infringing activity. Consequently, the court will not authorize Strike 3 to take discovery premised on a feudal John Doe complaint. Importantly, a plaintiff's obligation to provide the grounds of his or her entitlement to relief requires more than labels and conclusion and a formulaic recitation of the elements of a cause of action. While the plausibility standard is not a probability requirement, a complaint must show more than sheer possibility that the defendant acted unlawfully. Facts merely consistent with a defendant's liability fall short of a plausible entitlement to relief and Strike Three's complaints are devoid of such facts, sufficient to show that John Doe IP subscriber is the party it's entitled to relief from. The only material fact pled in Strike Three's complaints is that the listed IP address is associated with the downloading of their works, and that John Doe is the subscriber. All other material averments in the complaints that the John Doe subscriber downloaded the works are conclusory statements. If Strike 3's complaints are stripped of all their conclusory statements, they are left with the notion that merely subscribing to an IP address that downloaded copyrighted works is sufficient to make out a cause of action for copyright infringement. This is not sufficient. As stated in Bell Atlantic v. Twombly, a uh, landmark or often cited jurisdiction case, where the well-pled facts do not permit the court to infer more than a mere possibility of misconduct, the complaint has alleged, but it has not shown, that the pleader is entitled to relief. So it has to show via facts, not allege via conclusions. Despite its lack of knowledge of who downloaded its works, Strike 3 argues its complaints pass muster because it is plausible the IP subscriber was the infringer. That's just a possibility in my opinion. The court also agrees with me. No Third Circuit decision addresses the pleading issue presented here. Importantly, the only circuit court decision on point is Cobbler, Nevada. In Cobbler, the Ninth Circuit decided whether a bare allegation that a defendant is the registered subscriber of an IP address associated with infringing activity is sufficient to state a claim for direct contributory infringement. Uh, see, I don't, I don't like that. Direct infringement and contributory infringement are two separate things. Like this case, the only allegation connecting Gonzalez to infringing activity was that Gonzalez was the subscriber. In affirming the district court's dismissal, the court wrote, quote, the direct infringement claim fails because Gonzalez's status as the registered subscriber of an infringing IP address standing alone does not create a reasonable inference that he is also the infringer, because multiple devices can use an IP address simply identifying the subscriber solves only part of the puzzle. Plaintiff must allege something more to create a reasonable inference, and that's what we're going to keep calling it. We're going to call it something more. So you need something more than a mere allegation that subscriber is infringer. The complaint in Cobbler is similar to Strike 3's form complaints in that the only connection between John Doe is the registration as an internet subscriber. This is not enough to plead a valid claim, Cobbler. This is a situation where a complaint pleads facts that are merely consistent with the defendant's liability, stopping short of the line between possibility and plausibility of entitlement to relief and not enough to raise the right to relief above a mere speculative level. The Ninth Circuit made clear in Cobbler that a copyright infringement claim based merely on a defendant's status as a subscriber is not enough to meet the plausibility requirement. And they're going to talk about that a bunch here. The court is aware of authority that limits Cobbler to the motion to dismiss context, and this is where we got, we got our 
motions to quash denied earlier this year, mostly here. The Pennsylvania and Virginia courts summarizing said the same thing as we're about to see, see here. Some decisions hold that Cobbler only applies after the plaintiff has had an opportunity to obtain discovery of subscriber's identity. The court ruled that Cobbler does not stand for the proposition that subpoenas may not be used to determine a subscriber's name. However, this court respectfully disagrees that Cobbler should be given such a narrow reading. First, the Ninth Circuit in Cobbler did not specifically address a discovery issue. So the court will not read into the decision a ruling that was not decided. And they quote Wright v. Spaulding, for a court's conclusion about an issue to be part of its holding, the court must have actively applied the conclusion to the case in front of it, and it must be clear that the court considered the issue and consciously reached a conclusion about it. Second, for the reasons already stated, it would be anomalous to permit a plaintiff in a John Doe case to obtain discovery based on a futile boilerplate complaint. Such bootstrapping must be barred to protect the integrity of the courts. In this court's view, Cobbler carries just as much weight in the context of a motion for expedited discovery or motion to quash as it does in the context of a motion to dismiss. So that's awesome. That's a really powerful statement there saying that Cobbler applies at the expedited discovery phase as well. Meaning, meaning we can use that in New Jersey to get rid of strike three holdings cases. This is certainly not the first and only opinion denying a motion for expedited discovery because of a deficient pleading. Third, for reasons already discussed in the context of examining the totality of the circumstances, it is appropriate to examine in the first instance whether the complaint can withstand a dismissal motion. And they cite Malibu Media versus Joe Park, a, a defendant who defaulted against Malibu Media, who's doing the same kind of boilerplate complaints and using the same company, IPP Limited, or IPP International. In denying plaintiff's unopposed motion for a default judgment, the court recognized that simply naming an IP subscriber does not make out a copyright infringement claim and does not show that the subscriber is liable. The court agreed with Cobbler and stated, plaintiff will have to show something more than merely tying defendant to an IP address in order to sufficiently establish copyright infringement. The assumption that the person who pays for internet access at a given location is the same individual who allegedly downloaded a single video is tenuous, and one that has grown more so over time. The court is not unsympathetic to Strike Three's argument that without the requested discovery, it may not be able to identify infringers. After all, who can argue with the notion that Strike Three has a right to protect its copyrights? However, the fact that the law lags behind technology is not an ill a court can cure. The court will not create a remedy for Strike Three that does not exist under law. Quote, while we recognize this obstacle to naming the correct defendant, this complication does not change the plaintiff's burden to plead factual allegations that create a reasonable inference that the defendant is the infringer. The court recognizes that technology limitations potentially put a plaintiff in a difficult position in naming the correct defendant, but such limitations do not relieve a plaintiff of alleging sufficient facts so that a court can reasonably infer that the named defendant is the actual infringer. Quoting another Strike Three Holdings case, the court says the, uh, the enforcement problem that peer-to-peer -peer file sharing technology creates for copyright owners is one that Congress could choose to remedy at any time. The fact that Congress has not acted does not mean that courts should take it upon themselves to provide more effective enforcement mechanisms to potential plaintiffs. The court concludes that Strike Three's concern about its ability to enforce its copyrights against peer-to-peer -peer file sharers is a valid one, but not one that provides good cause to depart from the applicable discovery rules. Maybe someday someone will show the court a method to identify infringers with sufficiently less risk of false accusations, but because Strike 3 fails to do so here, it cannot subpoena defendant's ISP. And so then they start to go into other reasons to deny the motion for discovery. It appears to the court that Strike 3 sacrifices the accuracy of its pleadings so that it can bootstrap X by discovery. In other words, Strike 3 sacrifices accuracy for expediency. This was effectively acknowledged by Strike 3's attorney, who stated, we do say it's the subscriber because that's what we're going to need the subpoena for to help us get the identity for further investigation. I think we're saying 
in our initial complaint that the subscriber is going to get us to that infringer. Except that's not what they say, and that was my argument that that's not what they say, and I really have no idea why we were denied. Strike 3 acknowledges its complaints are filed for the sole purpose of enabling it to seek expedited discovery, not... So the original complaint, the John Doe complaint, is not filed for the purpose of adjudicating their rights. It's filed for the purpose of getting the subpoena. The amended complaint is filed for the purposes of adjudicating their rights. This court is not the only court troubled by these pleadings. In another case, a court said, it is thus apparent that Strike 3 is deliberately asserting claims in a scattershot fashion against a broad array of individuals simply because it is confident that many of them will be liable even if almost as many of them are not. Such a pleading seems wholly inconsistent with the requirement that plaintiff may not file a complaint for an improper purpose, the certainty that such an approach will impose needless burdens on innocent individuals counsels against a finding of good cause to permit expedited discovery. This court agrees. Strike three subpoenas are misleading in that they don't explain the difference between a subscriber and a defendant with respect to the allegations. They only identify the infringer as one of its works is another deficiency. There is no particular rhyme or reason to the infringement date listed to strike three subpoenas. It always chooses the first one that's listed in the form. The problem with Strike 3 subpoenas is that it does not reveal that the subscriber identified by its subpoenas is the same subscriber as when its works were infringed. For example, as to the exemplar complaint that we've seen, it only asks for the name of the subscriber from July 27th, 2018, but there's a nine-month period that the alleged infringement occurred. And its motions to strike, Strike 3... <laughs> Wow, it's the first time I did that. In its motions, Strike 3 does not mention that due to dynamic IP addresses, the name of the subscriber identified on one date may not be the name of the subscriber identified on another date. This information is not revealed by Strike 3, even though Strike 3 recognizes there are a limited number of IP addresses, the addresses are dynamic, and they therefore change. And Leonard French literally made this argument in Pennsylvania and Virginia court this year and was denied. Just maybe a little maybe a little bit of indication for Leonard French there. Strike three knows that at different times different people can have the same IP address different times. This fact is recognized by numerous courts. They explain dynamic IP addresses, which can last anywhere from, well, it's really, it's user, conf it's, it's, it's administrator configurable. So it could really be anywhere from seconds to days. So it really could be that your IP address changes every single time you log in, or it could be that you have it set up to always give you the same IP address, no matter what happens. I do that on my home network. You have certain static IP addresses that are then served up by DHCP, which is cool because the computer does this, does the dynamic looking, and then the router knows to give you the same static address over and over again. An IP address is not really an address, etc. We know how IP addresses work. I'm, I'm going to kind of skip over that. Given the dynamic nature of IP addresses, the court cannot be sure that the subscriber's name revealed by Strike 3 subpoenas is the name of the subscriber on the infringement date. And we're just going to skip ahead to the next argument now. Strike 3 has other available means to stop infringements. I'm going to summarize this one for you. Strike 3 is not required under the law, copyright law as written. They are not required to send DMCA takedown notices before filing a lawsuit. They are not required to uh, file a lawsuit on the first infringement and not wait. They can wait to file a lawsuit, and we have researched this issue, and you are allowed to wait the full three years statute of limitations and file for all the infringements that happened in the three years. However, they've made the argument in their request for the expedited subpoena, expedited discovery, They've made their argument that they deserve all of this because all these things are true, because the subscriber is the defendant, is the infringer, and the IP address is got to be the right person when they, only, when they only subpoenaed one date and time, even though they accumulate these things over a long period of time. So by not telling the court all about that, by, and, and by, by using that to get the subpoena, they have not used all these other remedies that they, that they say they do. They want to deter infringement. They want to prevent infringement. They're not just out to make money off of infringement, but then they're not taking steps to deter the infringement that are more effective than suing. The lawsuits really don't have any effect, and they're counting on that. And it turns out 
that they do send DMCA takedown notices to non-residential individual subscribers. So hear me out on this. If they get a subscriber's identity and it turns out it goes to a Starbucks, they might send a DMCA. If they identify an IP address without a subpoena as going to a McDonald's or a Starbucks or, a, or the Pirate Bay or whatever, or they find a listing online on the Pirate Bay, they send a DMCA. They don't sue. But everybody who's a residential individual defendant, not don't know their name yet, they just know an IP address and MaxMind has given them a location. They think that that location is a residential area, they sue you instead of sending a DMCA takedown. So the court feels this is quite disingenuous to tell the court that you want to prevent infringement but then not be actually taking steps to prevent the infringement. It is unreasonable to grant Strike 3's expedited request when Strike 3 chooses not to avail itself of legal remedies that do not involve filing thousands of complaints that impinge on the constitutionally protected privacy rights of New Jersey subscribers. So they go over the DMCA. The DMCA affords copyright owners such as Strike 3 a process to notify ISPs of the infringements of their works. The ISPs are then required to act on valid notifications and terminate, in appropriate circumstances, subscribers and account holders who are repeat infringers. They could send a DMCA to the service provider who would then put a strike on the user's account and after the third strike would disconnect the user. And if they didn't do that, then you have the Cox case where Cox got sued for the copyright infringement of its users because it did not implement a proper policy for repeat infringers. One would think that Strike 3 would be eager to notify ISPs that its subscribers are infringing so that the infringer's internet service would be interrupted, suspended, or terminated, and infringement would stop. However, Strike 3 does not take this step, but instead files thousands of lawsuits, arguing that it has no other recourse. Inexplicably, Strike 3 does not send takedown notices concerning the individual subscribers it sues, but yet sends these notices to torrent websites, Google, and other infringing websites like the Pirate Bay. And the recent case of BMG Rights Management versus Cox Communication shows their, the futility and debunkability of their argument. The court ruled that Cox could not assert a safe harbor defense because it did not implement the required repeat infringer policy. Let's see if we can put a bubble to that video because we covered that case as well. So therefore, there is a questionable amount of deterrent this does not appear to be the case that these lawsuits effectively deter infringers. Despite filing thousands of these lawsuits, Strike 3 recognizes that infringement has actually increased. Approximately 200,000 to 400,000 people illegally download its videos every month. Also, the court recently learned that Strike 3 only targets the limited universe of residential subscribers of reputable ISPs. The innocent subscriber may have to pay a substantial sum to retain a lawyer and defend a lawsuit and possibly settle to avoid incurring future costs. Strike 3 unduly minimizes the subscriber's substantial interest in the privacy of their subscription information. Article 1, Paragraph 7 of the New Jersey Constitution protects an individual's privacy interest in the subscriber information provided to an ISP. So New Jersey has a stronger privacy protection than is at the federal level. The right to privacy created by New Jersey and its constitution provides greater protection than the privacy rights in the federal constitution. So then the court's going to go through a final rebuttal of their arguments, and we're just not going to cover that anymore. It's not justified when Strike 3 Holdings bootstraps its discovery requests onto a deficient pleading, as we've read about a dozen times before. And the, the court basically is summarizing more. And here's where I get confused. Accordingly, for the foregoing reasons, and to the extent it has not already been done, it will be ordered that Strike 3's motions for expert discovery are denied. Okay, so that was plural. Follow me here. That was plural. as multiple motions. We have, we're in four cases on this particular opinion. To the extent these motions have been previously granted, and the defendant has not been served, the orders will be vacated. The court will not interfere with cases where Strike 3 has identified a defendant other than through an X by discovery request issued with leave of court. So where I'm confused is, is that just the four cases listed here at the top of the complaint, or is that 
all future strike three holdings New Jersey cases. I think it's all future strike three holdings cases, but I'm being extremely conservative about that because my interest is in protecting my client's rights. And so uh, we will, I will take whatever steps my clients allow me to take to, uh, to try and vindicate their rights and we'll see what happens. I can't go any further into any of my clients. Uh, it's confidential information, very, very highly confidential. So uh, I'm gonna shove about that right now and just say that I will do whatever my clients allow me to do and will I'll definitely be advising people about the power of this document. This might even be able to be cited, well, it is able to be cited, but will it be able to be cited successfully in cases outside of New Jersey that we have yet to see? New York is a different appellate circuit and uses the Arista Records standard, for example, that, that this court denied Strike 3 Holdings the opportunity to use. Ewan asks the other relevant question about this. The court will not interfere with cases where Strike 3 has identified a defendant other than through expedited discovery. So if Ewan asks, is it cases that have already been identified through an expedited subpoena? No, I think those cases are somewhere in between and the judge will has vacated everything that's where a defendant has not been served. So if the defendant has been served, can we go backwards then and say, well, they shouldn't have been able to get defendant's identity in the beginning anyway, and so fruit of the poisonous tree, which is a criminal doctrine. I don't know, can you apply fruit of the poisonous tree to a civil copyright case? I don't know. I don't know. We have to find these things out. This is the cutting edge of law. You are seeing brand new law and brand new responses to brand new behaviors being created in law. This is like watching... Uh, Pan Pangea. This is like watching Genesis. This is like watching birth. This is amazing to me, and that's why I'm really excited about it. Plus, I might be able to save my clients a lot of money, and they really like it when I do that. So that that might be cool for me as an attorney. Yeah, it was definitely <laughs> um, when I sent you the um, the the order and opinion. I was like, I'm sorry to interrupt your wedding weekend, but this is big. <laughs> it's really good. I, could, I had to read it like there, like there was some downtime and I was like, no, I'm reading this now. <laughs> I didn't get through it through it all. I actually only got through half of it over the weekend and then the other half of it last, well, I guess it's still the weekend, but I read the other half of it last night so that I would know what's in it and try to present 47 pages to you in less than an hour because that's a record. I think. Thank you for joining me. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. We really appreciate your support on patreon.com slash ljfrench and sponsors.com slash law. I don't mean we just appreciate it. We depend on it. We have staff that we pay and we have expenses for news organizations and, and technology. And we have uh, just people who deserve to eat and have a living wage. And we really appreciate if you could help us continue our mission to educate the lawful masses by sponsoring us at those links. Thank you to our October channel sponsor, Joshua Davis from Tanda Pay. Thank you to the $50 plus supporters, Joe Tyson, Aspernari, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Michael Pierce, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Daniel Perez, Snorri Wizotsky, Black Leaf, and Benjamin Hytov. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on the screen in front of me and everyone will be on the LED panel behind me. Thank you all for joining me. It was a lot to get through. I really appreciate it. We'll see you in the next one. I love you all. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you to Brandon and Tactical and Blackleaf and Kaylee who have joined us in the virtual studio today. Bye.